Greetings again, everybody. Nice to see you out on such a beautiful day. It's not raining inside. Come out from among them of the world, and be separate, saith the Lord, and he said he would receive us. But it's not all. Now, you know, we find out at the summer camps, some of the children sort of let things out about their parents at home. The parents don't realize, and we find that there are, and, there, and I don't necessarily mean this church, I don't know if there's a one in this church here, but in Pasadena, I mean, but in different churches over the country, some of the children tell on their mothers. They wear makeup through the week, and especially when they go shopping at the store or the supermarket. They take it off when they come to church. Well, that is deceiving, and it is not honest. They are disobeying God. I'm glad it's only a few, and I'm I'm glad that most of our women want to get into the kingdom of God. And brethren, I tell you, it's a matter of what are we hungering and thirsting for, to be like the world, or are we hungering and thirsting for God's righteousness? I wonder if you ever thought about this thing of hungering and thirsting for God's righteousness. I remember just recently, it hit me in a different way than I ever saw it before. I thought about God himself. He has that righteousness, and he certainly doesn't have to have any hurt conscience. He doesn't have to have any fears or worries about having to reap what he sows. He has perfect faith. It makes me think of a song was, Oh, what a glorious feeling. Where was that song? I don't know what it was. It just comes to my mind. But it is. If we just had God's righteousness, what a wonderful feeling it would be in our minds. Even then, harm might come to us, persecution, accidents in this life, but at least we wouldn't be bringing them on ourselves. And we bring so many things on ourselves, and we don't realize it. Now, the greatest subject in all the universe is God's purpose. God and the Word lived. I've discussed how they lived a number of times, but they lived. And if they lived, they must have lived for some purpose. In the book, The Seven Laws of Success, I've written that the first law of success in this life is having the right goal. Well, do you know that God has that right goal? God's purpose. That's the first law in God's life, is his purpose. That is his goal, what he intends to accomplish. God is looking down through the stream of time. God has always existed. God always will exist. And he's looking into the far, far, far future, forever. And he's thinking ahead. What is his purpose? What is his goal? What's he trying to achieve? What is his purpose? Now, the Bible says his purpose shall stand, and it will. His purpose shall be accomplished. We read in Romans, the eighth chapter, now beginning with verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Now, we had a minister. He had to leave the church because he kept preaching one thing, all things work together for good, and he stopped right there. 
He forgot it is to them that love God. He didn't add that. And he did not love God himself. And he was not leading his flock toward God. And he isn't in that pulpit any longer. He's out of the church. But it is to them that love God, to them who are the called. Now notice it, only those that are called, them that are called according to his purpose. God's purpose, that's God's ultimate goal. And brethren, you and I are part of that ultimate purpose and goal of God. That is the most important thing to him in his life is your future and my future. That's the most important thing to God. That's why I'm so glad that when a thing like this comes up, this particular subject, it's only one subject, and incidentally the dirt, colored dirt, or else on your face isn't going to harm your face so much. The harm is in the attitude and the spirit and in your mind and heart. The sin isn't the dirt. Sin is the thing that is in your mind and attitude and heart and in the action that it leads to. But notice, according to God's purpose, for whom he did foreknow. You see, we are the call that he did foreknow. Now, those that are not called, he did not foreknow. It is only referring to predestination. And we, brethren, have been predestinated to be called now. Others are to be called, yes, but later. Everybody's going to be called. Now, it's appointed to all men once to die. And after this, the judgment. Again, as in Adam all die, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, so in Christ shall the same all be made alive. All who ever died are going to come back to life again. And though all of those are going to come into a judgment, and in that judgment the book of life is going to be there. And some are going to have their names written in that book of life. In fact, I think most of them. God doesn't tell us how many because I think he himself doesn't know. He's made us free moral agents. And God has purpose, that's part of his purpose, that we ourselves must make that decision. He isn't going to make that for us. He will make the decision of whom he will call when. Now, he has decided to call you and me now, uh, in advance of the others. Now, we're called at a time when it's much more difficult for us than it is going to be for them when they're called. I tell some people, well, God is calling us now, but salvation is not for others now. Then they say, well, then God's unfair. Oh, no. God is calling us now in a more difficult time than he's going to call them, but he's calling us now to learn and to become to become priests and rulers, kings and priests, and to reign over the others and help call them and help them bring in the harvest when he calls them. They'll have an easier time. There won't be any Satan around then. And there was a marvelous sermon preached here this morning on Satan and the demons and the devil, but and this is their world. And what a terrible world it is. And it was pretty well pictured this morning from this pulpit. Notice that. For whom he did foreknow them also, he did predestinate to be uh, formed to the image of his Son, that he, the Son, Christ, might be the firstborn of many brethren. Now, I want you to get this. In fulfilling God's purpose, he, Christ is the second Adam, and he started what the first Adam did not start. This is Satan's world. 
and God is starting another world, another civilization. You know, people think if civilization, if civilization ended, that would be the greatest tragedy that could happen. Oh, the end of civilization, wouldn't that be terrible? You know, I think I need to have a telecast on that. Civilization is going to end, and it ought to end. And the sooner this civilization ends, the better. And when we are told to pray, Our Father which is in heaven, thy kingdom come, we mean thy civilization, another civilization come, and this civilization has to go. And the sooner this civilization is gone, the better for everybody. So notice it that Christ was the firstborn. Now, we are next. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22, it said, As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Christ the firstfruit, he was the firstborn. Afterward, they that are Christ, that's the many brethren, at his coming, and then comes the end. Afterward will come the resurrection of all the others after the millennium. But during the millennium, salvation is going to be open to everybody that is still alive on earth. But we're going to be kings and priests. We're going to be chained from mortal to immortal. We won't be human any longer. We'll be God. And we'll be there to teach and to judge them. As Paul wrote in one scripture, know ye not that we shall judge the world. That's when judgment comes on them. But judgment is on us now. Judgment is now on you and me. And when I say, I used to have to speak to the men who smoked. At that time, women didn't smoke. I guess we got smoking pretty well out of the church. I hope I don't have to speak on that anymore. There still may be a few doing it secretly. Well, I may talk about that a little later and why, how we found that learned that smoking is a sin, although the Bible says nothing about tobacco or tobacco smoke. Now, I want you to notice a little more while we're on this scripture. Let's go back in the same eighth chapter and notice what he's talking about and notice the purpose of God. Go back to the 18th verse. Paul says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not to be um, compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. The glory that shall be revealed in us. Look, let me just say, the women that want to glorify themselves in front of a mirror now and seeking a certain vain self-glory won't we even be in that glory. Just leave it to God and let him glorify you, and you'll have a glory that passes all your imagination. The glory that shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation, it should be, watches for the manifestation of the sons of God. Manifestation is when we can see that we're the sons of God. Now, in First John, the, see the third chapter, you read that, Behold, even now we are already the sons of God, but it does not uh, appear yet what we shall be. That is, it isn't manifested. You can't see what we shall be when we're like him, with our faces like the very sun, our eyes like flames of fire. No, we have pale faces now, and women want to paint them up. Some women, the women of the world do. But the whole creation is waiting for the sons of God to appear. For the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath uh, subjected the same in hope, because the creation itself also shall uh, be delivered from uh, the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. 
For we know that the whole creation groans and trembles in pain together until now. And not only they, but uh, ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Once again, we're just the first to be called, and Christ is the first of the first, the firstborn of many brethren. Well, you see, we are to rule the whole universe, ultimately. And the whole universe is going to be changed. It's going to be a different universe than it is now, entirely. And what God has planned for other planets and other worlds, he has not revealed. But he gives us a hint here and in the second chapter of the book of uh, Hebrews, where it says that the whole universe is going to be put under us, and we're going to have power over the whole universe, and we're going to reign. Well, I must get on. I'd like to dwell on that a little more, but the, God's wonderful purpose is to reproduce himself, and ultimately he put mankind on earth for that purpose. But when you consider what is God, God is holy, righteous, perfect, spiritual character. And to reproduce him, his character, his righteousness must be reproduced in us. It must be. Now, all of this involves the question of sin. And I wonder how many of us yet understand sin and what it is, and how do you define sin? Even in this church, brethren, we've been mixed up to a, great, a greater extent than we realize on how we define what is sin. Just what is sin? Now, we know that sin is the transgression of the law. But let's go back a little farther. I talked about the purpose of God and that God originally lived before he created mankind on the earth and before he even created angels. Now, how did God and the Word live when they lived together? They lived in a manner of love, and love is an outgoing concern for the welfare and the good of the other. That is, desiring the welfare and the good of others, not wanting to take from others, not glorifying the self, but concerning others, but God, first of all, worship and obedience of God, and then love, cooperation, helping, serving, sharing toward man. Now, love itself is a way of life. And it is outgoing, never incoming. Incoming is lust. And love is the opposite. It goes in the opposite direction. Now, the way that love can come in is if you love your own mind and body to the extent you know it is the temple of God's Holy Spirit and that your mind controls and God has given you the responsibility of taking care of this mind and body of yours keeping it clean and useful for his spirit to dwell in it. That kind of love is how you love yourself. You see, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But that doesn't mean self-glory and selfish love in the sense that people of the world love themselves. Love, then, is a way of life. It is, then, a law. Now, what is law? I spoke before the law school of Southern California, uh, uh, the University of Southern California, a few weeks ago, and I defined law to them. It is simply the rules that regulate human performance or human conduct. For example, the rules of life. The rules of a basketball or a baseball game or something are merely the law of that game. Law means the rules that regulate conduct. That's what it is. 
It is a way, then, of life. All right, let's put it in modern language, it is a lifestyle. Now, people have got the idea that there's a new lifestyle going on in the world today, and that lifestyle involves the wrong kind of music, the wrong kind of dress, and of exposure, especially on the part of women. That lifestyle involves a lot of things that they do, and it involves what they call good grooming or makeup. And that is not necessary to good grooming under any circumstances whatsoever. That's a misnomer. Well, now, how did sin ever start? Because sin is a transgression of the law, and the law is love. And the law is love, and that's the way God and the Word lived. That was their lifestyle. Now, I'm talking about God's lifestyle, and I'm talking about God's motive, God's purpose, or God's goal, and what he had. And his goal concerns you and me, and we're vitally concerned in it. Now, let's go back and see how sin first started, because sin entered the world. And it ended through Adam, but before Adam, sin had come into this earth. And we go back to the 28th chapter of Ezekiel, and in verse 15, speaking of the great archangel Lucifer, God says, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day thou wast created. He's a created being. He wasn't ever born. He was separately created until iniquity was found in thee. That is lawlessness. He broke God's law, or the words, a different lifestyle, a different way of thinking, a different attitude toward life and toward God and toward everything. We heard so much in the morning sermon about attitude and attitude toward things. And that's the whole thing in, in, in your mind that either leads to sin or to righteousness. Now in verse 17, thine heart was lifted up why? Because of thy beauty. Beauty went to his head. Now, does that ever happen to a woman? Oh, a woman, you know, oh, yeah, no, no, it's, it's not vanity. Oh, no. You know, women, if there were no mirrors, no one would wear uh, uh, makeup, would they? I know a woman who said, I would rather look pretty in the mirror and with my makeup on than have good knowledge or wisdom or understanding or good character. I just want to see my face look pretty to me. Now that is not character, I'm sorry to say. It's a funny thing, that same woman said one time in England. He said, you know, Mrs. Hunting is not pretty. She's beautiful. You know what she meant? Mrs. Hunting didn't wear makeup. But the beauty was in her character. The beauty you could see down through her eyes, not anything she painted around the outside to to uh, frame the eyes or to make them stand out. It was something that you could see down inside. If you want to know what I mean, brother, let me just say something. The academic center I have named after my wife, who died uh, over 17 years ago now, and it's named in her honor. And her picture is there on the mantel in the in the grand lobby of uh, Ambassador Hall. Go up and look at that painting of my wife's face, and look at those eyes. And if the light isn't good, turn the light on so you can see it. You can see down in, there's no paint on her at all, but look down inside, and you see character. That's where, that's where real beauty is. I remember my grandmother said when I was a little boy, 
that beauty is as beauty does. Beauty is inside, and it's in the heart or the mind, or that faculty of mind that involves your intent, your attitude, your purpose, your desire, what you live for. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Desire to have beauty. And that brought about the thing that is just, the, you might say, the father of sin. You might say the root of sin. I know they say that the love of money is the root of all evil, but here is something that is really the father of sin. His heart was lifted up because of his beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. That is, the brightness of his beauty. And that's where it started. Now, that in itself was not just a whole sin. That was where it started. It led to violence. It led to what you heard described in the sermon this morning. The whole purpose of Satan is to destroy. It is hatred. Hatred toward anything and everybody. And a desire to hurt, to harm, to destroy, to get for self, but to destroy everything else. And it all started from beauty. The beauty was the father of it that started it. Vanity is self-glory, and it leads to wanting to get, and it led to sin. And that's where sin first started in the universe. Now, he had been perfect in his ways from the day that he was created. God didn't make him evil. God made him very, very beautiful. Now we go to another passage about him in the 14th chapter of Isaiah. And uh, let me see, beginning, uh, my pages got mixed up here a little bit. Beginning with verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? His name was Lucifer, and Luc Lucifer means shining star of the dawn, or a bringer of light. In other words, he was one who proclaimed righteousness. He knew righteousness, and he turned away from it. O Lucifer, son of the morning, or morning star, how art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations, or cut down, uh, thou which did weaken the nations, cut down to the ground. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, or the angels of God. Now he had a throne. It was on the earth. He was going to go up to heaven. He's going to ascend, so there he was down here on earth. He was going to ascend above the clouds. I will sit also upon the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the clouds. So he was under the clouds. I will be, it says here, like the Most High. And I believe if you get the original Hebrew, it was said, I'll become the Most High. And that's what he really meant. As I have always believed. Now, that is how sin entered in the first place in the universe. But now, how did it enter humanity? How did it enter in the world? We go back to Genesis now, to the third chapter of Genesis. God had created the man, and I've gone into that, and the two trees that were set before them. And the man was to uh, have jurisdiction over his wife, and she was supposed to be subject to him, but she wasn't. And he wasn't on the job, and she sort of stole away and sneaked away, and and Adam, I don't know where Adam was, he wasn't watching after her, that now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the eternal God had made. And the woman encountered uh, the serpent, which was Satan the devil, in the form of a serpent or a snake, 
And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. God said, You will die. You are a soul, and the soul that sins, it shall die. If you sin, you're going to die. He said, You won't surely die, for God knows better. God knows that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes will be opened, and you shall be as God again. You will be God just as he wanted to be. Now he tempted her to want to become God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw, now she saw something with her eyes, and her eyes entered into it, that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes. And there again, what is pleasant to the eyes was a great temptation. When she looks into a mirror today, and her face, she wants to make it look nice, and she thinks paint makes it look better. I don't. I disagree with any woman who thinks paint makes her face look better. I Several times I turn off certain programs on television when I see such painted women, or painted hussies, I call them, that I can't stand to look at them with all that paint and eye makeup and all that stuff on their faces. They don't look human. Well, maybe they do look human. They don't look like God made them. They look like human, uh, like they were human made, all right. Anyway, when the woman saw it was pleasant to the eyes that she took and desired to make one wise, that appealed to her vanity again, intellectual vanity, she took of the, tr uh, the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband, and he did eat. So he wasn't looking after his wife, and she wasn't subordinate to her husband, as God said a wife ought to be. Then uh, Satan's government started, because they started out obeying Satan rather than God. And Satan put his ideas into the minds of Adam and Eve. Adam got it too, and something happened to their minds at that time, and a world started. Now, I've explained how they had the one spirit, they needed the second spirit, the spirit of God. They didn't have God's spirit. They took the knowledge of good and evil. In other words, to decide for themselves what is good and what is evil. Now, there is good in what we call human nature. There is good in this life. And many of the people in the world that have uh, filled with human nature, and God isn't in their life, they pay no attention to God, God, they never think about God. They're conscious that there is a God, and once in a while it comes to mind and all of that. Some of them are atheists and don't believe in God. Some say, well, I suppose there is a God, but they never think about him. He's not part of their lives in any, any way. And so they have uh, high, lofty ideals. They have good morals. They have many traits of good in them. I can't think of all the words that I want to use right now. There is good in this world. There is a certain amount of love in this world. I would say that mother love is perhaps the highest, but even that is selfish when you stop to think. Now, the love of God is a greater love. That mounts up to an altogether different level. It's a different kind of love. Now, sin is the transgression of the law, but the law is love. And while I'm on it, I want you to listen. Love is the fulfilling of the law. But you weren't born with a kind of love that can fulfill the law of God. All human love is carnal. There is another kind of love that is on a higher level, a higher plane, altogether. And that is the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, Romans 5 and verse 5. And that is the only kind of love that can give you God's righteousness. Do you hunger and thirst for that? Brethren, we're called to hunger and thirst for that. That's what we're called for. We've had our opportunity. We're having it now. We're being judged now. We're not going to get another chance later. The world 
has not had any chance yet. The world hasn't been called yet. We have been called to come out of this world. This is Satan's world. It is Satan's world started by the human Adam which started obeying Satan. Jesus Christ came, the Son of God, and to start God's world. And God started his world, God's world, by Jesus Christ, the second Adam. That's why he's called the second Adam. Now, he started out like the grain of mustard seed, one person. But that person was God in the human flesh, Jesus Christ. And he called twelve, and he began to teach them. And at the end of his ministry, there had been a hundred and twenty that followed and still endured. And on the day of Pentecost, that hundred and twenty received the Holy Spirit and started the church. Just a hundred and twenty. Started quite small. That's a very small church. Look how many more of us are right here in this auditorium this afternoon. And I think a lot of others are going to hear this sermon because it's being recorded and I want them to hear it in other places. So Satan's government continues, and Satan is sitting on the throne of this world. Now Jesus came then as the second Adam. He came to start another civilization, a civilization with a different lifestyle, a civilization that would obey the law of God. Now Satan sat on a throne. He was a king, and is here to administer the government of God, and he was a teacher of light, of truth. That was his name. Lucifer means shining star of the dawn, or light bringer. And light means truth in this case, the truth of God in the right way. Now, Jesus came then as the second Adam to start a different civilization. He didn't come to save Satan's world. He didn't come to try to convert the people in this world. He met the woman at Jacob's well on the way up to Samaria, up to, uh, yes, to Samaria, is in, in the land of Samaria. And, uh, see, I guess he was going on up to, uh, Nazareth. And he met this woman, a Gentile, at the well. He said, give me a drink of water. And uh, he said, if you knew who it is speaking to you, he, you would ask him, and he could give you living waters, then you would never thirst again. Well, she didn't know what he meant, of course, but she said, well, give me this living water. What a wonderful opportunity that was for Jesus to convert her and say, all right, I'll, I'll tell you, I can give you if you just repent, and if you believe in me and accept me in your heart, and give your heart to me, I'll give you the Holy Spirit. That's what he meant by living water. He didn't do that. He told her of her sin. He said, go and call your husband. She said, I don't have any husband. Well, Jesus said, you told the truth for once, didn't you? You've had five husbands, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. She wondered, how did he know all those things about her? Well, he was God in the human flesh. That's how he knew. But Jesus came and said, I will build my church. And so he started the church, people coming out of this world to live a different lifestyle. That's what it amounted to, brethren. Now in Second Corinthians, well, I think I did quote that a while ago, uh, he called for those that are called, he said, to come out from among them of the world and be separate and live a different lifestyle, in other words. In other words, come out of sin. And sin is the transgression of the law. The law is God's way of life. And the very start of transgressing that law is vanity. I won't say that vanity is just the chief sin, but I'll say it's the father of all sin. And it's, it's where it starts, and it's going to lead you into other sins. Now, this world lives in sin. Sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. The law is spiritual, Romans 
uh, 7 and uh, verse 14. It's a spiritual law. It is the way of love, and that is a principle, a way of life. It's a principle of outflowing love or concern for others' welfare. And uh, toward God, it is worship and obedience, but toward neighbor, it is uh, uh, desire for their welfare and all that sort of thing. Now, let's see, Second Corinthians 3 and verse 6. Do I have that here? Who also hath made us, oh yes, about how how we observe the law. And uh, sin is the transgression of the law. Now, I want you to notice how Paul was teaching in the New Testament, speaking of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit maketh life. Now, they had to obey the law according to the letter in the Old Testament. They could not obey it according to the Spirit because they didn't have God's Holy Spirit. As I said a while ago, the love with which you are born is not capable of really fulfilling the spiritual law of love. It takes a love on a higher plane. It requires the love of God shut abroad in your hearts. They didn't have that love in the, in the Old Testament. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came, and Paul now is talking to people that had access to the Holy Spirit and should have received the Holy Spirit. And so, Paul says that we have obeyed the law according to the Spirit, in other words, the principle of the law. Now, let me explain a little bit about the principle of the law. The law is love, one word, but it magnifies. Now, what is the whole purpose of God? I said reproduce himself. In other words, enlarge himself, magnify himself, until there are many other persons that are born of him, become his born children, and become God just like he is God. But that kind of that his spirit and the kind of love that comes with his spirit, and the kind of attitude and life and lifestyle that goes with it has to be begotten and born into you before you can become God. And you, won't, you women won't have any paint on your faces when you're God, let me tell you that. Principle. And it's a principle away from self. It's love away from self. Because the only kind of love that fulfills God's law, and love is the fulfilling of all, is the love of God shed abroad in our hearts with the Holy Spirit. Now you magnify the law. It becomes love to God, and then love to neighbor. Now you see love in two directions. First toward God. That's what the world overlooks, and that's most important. That's more important than loving your neighbor. But you've got to love both. And... God's Holy Spirit shut abroad in our hearts means God's righteousness as compared to the world's goodness. And the world has goodness on one hand and wickedness on the other. And different people in the world, some have a certain virtues and certain uh, good morals, good intentions, high ideals and all that sort of thing, ethics and others are just criminal through and through. Like on television the last couple of days, it's been pretty much mentioned, a certain man, that he's been a criminal, he's been in penitentiaries, he, twice he's escaped recently, and as soon as he escaped the last time, he killed a woman and raped her, and every time you put him in, he'll try to escape and go out, and, and it, it, it just seems that he isn't going to be reformed. Well, some get down to that. Others have good ethics, high ideals, and, uh, and, 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 but they have vanity too, and they think they're pretty good in their own selves, in their own righteousness. But it is the righteousness of God, which is humility and never vanity, which exalts God first of all, and God says he will not give his glory to anyone else. 
You can't glorify yourself in front of a mirror. You, God is the one to be glorified. Now, this world follows Adam and the way he went. When it comes to the knowledge of good and evil, that's what he chose. And there is both good and evil in the world. But it's not God's kind of righteousness. It's not the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you, the love of God shed abroad in the heart of a woman is not going to sit in front of a mirror and pluck out her eyebrows and paint her eye or, or put on something to make her eyelashes stand out and put eyeshadow on her upper eyelids and outline her eyes so her eyes stand out and attract attention to the eyes. And she isn't going to put on a lot of lipstick and other things that w women wear in makeup. She just isn't going to do it. And when Adam took the knowledge of good and evil, he took good as well as evil, but it was good in the human sense. And as I said, that is not good on a plane high enough to get you into God's kingdom. It's not the kind of love that really fulfills God's law. It's not God's righteousness. That requires another kind of love altogether. Human good by carnal love. Now, the purpose of God and the church is that we hunger and thirst for and receive God's righteousness. We have to become like God to become God, to become his children. God is not going to give eternal life to any of us unless or until we are like that and have received that kind of righteousness. Because we are to become God. The purpose is to make man supreme, the supreme spirit, like God, supreme in character, the character of God, to become God. Now, in the spring of 1927, I was converted and baptized. I have been a light smoker. Some of you may be astonished to know that I used to smoke. Well, I did. I smoked a type of cigarettes that came in a box of ten. I always wanted quality. It was a quality brand, all right, a little more expensive than the average brand. <laughs> but a box of ten lasted me three days. In other words, I didn't average over about three cigarettes a day, not three packs. Once in a while I'd smoke a cigar, and I didn't like cigars because I uh, couldn't control the saliva flow in my mouth. And if I would, if I would swallow the saliva, why, uh, it would make me very sick like I was when I chewed tobacco when I was five years old. You may have read about that in my autobiography. And, uh, I always had to carry enough, an extra handkerchief or two and, and keep spitting into that handkerchief to get when I smoked a cigar. Well, I, I remember in Chicago years ago, I used to do that, especially if we'd attend a noonday luncheon of the Association of Commerce, of which I was then a member, and uh, it was fashionable then to smoke a cigar. Well, I was part of the world. I hadn't been converted yet. So if I smoked a cigar, I didn't smoke any cigarettes all day. Now, the idea of smoking came up. I was converted. I realized that the Bible said nothing about tobacco or tobacco smoke. All right, is it a sin? Now, let me get this point over. All liberals take this attitude. If there isn't a specific, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not, therefore, isn't it okay? Can't we go along with Satan and Satan's world? Isn't it okay? We only have to leave Satan just as far as God makes us. You know, they're like the woman that was in the church when it first started up in Eugene, Oregon, many years ago now, about 50 years ago. And uh, she hadn't been in the church very long. She was new. She hadn't received quite the fullness of God's Holy Spirit yet. And she came to me one day, and she hadn't been converted very long, just uh, maybe a, a couple of months or so. And she said that she had just... Uh, 
received a sum of money that she had inherited. Someone had died and some, maybe a grandparent or someone, and left her money. She said, now, Mr. Armstrong, I want you to tell me how much of this I have to tithe. Now, I don't want to tithe any more than I have to. I don't want to do any more toward God than I have to, but I do want to get into God's kingdom. Now, tell me how much I've got to do to get into God's kingdom. But she wanted to go with the world as far as she could. Well, now, isn't that the attitude of people who say, well, unless God says specifically thou shalt not, it's okay to go along with Satan. You can't go along with Satan, any, not to any extent at all. Satan and his ways have got to be put out of your attitude, your intent, your attitude of mind completely. Now, you'll never get it out completely out of your mind and your actions, perhaps. But we have to grow more and more into it. We have to continue to overcome. And that is a process. You don't overcome everything all at once. And you don't receive the full measure of the Holy Spirit to the extent that Jesus had the Holy Spirit at one fell swoop. Maybe he had a hundred percent and you only received one, one or two percent at the start. But you have to grow in grace and knowledge, the knowledge of Christ. That's what we have to do. And we don't grow trying to go Satan's way and saying, well, I'll just go as far in God's way as he commands me and makes me go, but I don't want to go that way any farther than, I, than I'm compelled to do. If that's your attitude, why then just make up your mind you're going into the lake of fire and just say goodbye, God, goodbye, church. I'm going to live it up while I can. I'm going to get what pleasure the world offers, and it doesn't offer you very much. I can promise you that. Well, I looked at smoking. I knew it wasn't in the Bible, but I read this in Second Corinthians, the third chapter. I knew that you have to apply the law according to its spirit or its principle, its obvious intent. Now, I said... That gets down, there has to be a reason for smoking. Why do I want to smoke? Why do I ever do it? Do I do it to show love toward God? Well, now, I thought I had read where prayers and things ascend up to God, like uh, for a sweet-smelling smelling savor, but I didn't think my second-hand smoke would be a sweet-smelling savor of God's nostrils. So I said, no, I don't do it to please God. I don't do it to show love toward God. Well, now do I do it to show love toward neighbor and for his, is it for his benefit and his welfare? Is it love toward neighbor? Well, now, there might be one out of a hundred or so that might enjoy my secondhand smoke. But on the other hand, there would be a great many others who would be repelled by it and find it obnoxious. And so many are finding secondhand smoke obnoxious that they're having to put on commercial airplanes now. They tell me, I haven't flown on one for so long, but they tell me that, that now they have separate compartments where there's no smoking. And they're even getting places, see, is some restaurants where, uh, there's a no smoking section or something like that. No, I, uh, I didn't do it to show love toward my neighbor. Well, now, what about taking care of myself, love toward self, in the sense of taking care of my mind and body? No, I knew what the lungs do, the function of the lungs. I didn't know if smoking had anything to do with lung cancer. I don't think anybody else knew anything about it back in 1927. But I did know the function of the lungs, and I knew that smoke in it is going to prevent the lungs from filtering out impurities and helping the elimination of poisons and toxins from the body for good health, and therefore it would be bad for my health. So I said, that ends it. The principle is not love toward God, it's lust toward self, or it's wanting to go along with the world because others do it, and because I want to smoke with others because they smoke. So I said, I will not smoke. And I have not smoked since. I'll let you in on a little something. 
I told someone about this personally the other day, and I don't mind letting you in on it. This must have been about ten years after that, when I was in Portland to do a broadcast, and I had to stay up there about three days, and this time my wife didn't go along, and I was up there alone in a hotel room. And you know, I got to thinking. I don't smoke, and I think that I would find, if I smoked again, that I, I, I would find I didn't enjoy it like I used to, and I just wonder. Now, I thought, I won't let myself go ahead and smoke, but I'm going to test it. I noticed that Solomon tested this and that and the other thing. So I, I bought another box of the same cigarettes that I had used to smoke. I went up to my room. I undressed. I took everything off. I got my clothes in a closet with the door closed so no smoke could get into my hook. Because if my wife smelled it when I got back home, woe be to me. <laughs> and I was stark naked, and I lit one cigarette. And half of it was uh, a couple of three puffs was enough. I felt dirty. It didn't smell good. I didn't like it. I threw it down the toilet and all the rest of the cigarettes and threw the box in the... Uh, waste basket, and I never did tell my wife, and maybe I'll have to tell her in the resurrection, but I can't tell her now. And that was the end of smoking. I learned my lesson. But I, I, I don't say I ever smoked again, because I just took a couple of puffs or three, and that was enough. I didn't smoke half of the cigarette anywhere near. Okay, now you know all the, all the worst about me. Well, that's why the whole church is not smoking. I applied the principle. Why do I do it? Will a woman be honest in applying the principle of why does she look into a mirror and paint up her face? Well, there are some women in the church that have not been honest about that. But God knows they're doing it for the reason of vanity or they're doing it to be like the world, or they're doing it because they're afraid of what the world will think of them if they don't. Now, it's got to be one of those three reasons. You tell me a reason why they do. Why do you need to change the face that God gave you? Now, I'll come to, uh, well, I might just as well do it now I'm on it. What about this thing of good grooming? Some ministers' wives have written me, two or three ministers' wives. They say, well, Mr. Armstrong, I want to tell you a woman's viewpoint about it. Well, I'm trying to tell you, brethren, God's viewpoint. Now, a woman's viewpoint, God says, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. Well, unto a woman, too. The ends thereof are the ways of death. The way is a woman's viewpoint, or a man's viewpoint. I know a lot of men have a viewpoint about smoking. It's all right, I'm all wrong. Well, they go their way, but I'm going to go God's way. Now, at that time, women didn't smoke. They do today. But men don't wear makeup, except on the stage or theater or someplace like that, and they look horrible when they do. I know when I started on television in 1955, they insisted I go in and have a makeup man put makeup on me because it was on a Hollywood studio. And I let a man start to do it once, and I had him take it off. I began to feel miserable the minute he began to put some stuff on me. I don't want my face painted. I don't need to wear makeup when I'm on television. Now, another woman who performs said, well, I only wear makeup when I'm on the stage and giving a performance. Brethren, that is not necessary. If we're going to be fear, and if it is a fear, a fear of what the world will say to you. Let me tell you another expression. I know a man that I knew quite well. And I had never heard him use bad language. He never did in my presence. I went to see him one Sunday afternoon, and he was out in front of his house. He lived way out in the suburbs up in Portland, Oregon. And he was doing some, a repair job on his own car. He did his own re, 
own repair work, and uh, we were talking, and I'd known him for quite a long time, and a couple of other guys came along, and they began to use God's name in vain and use other four-letter words, and, and it was a very bad language. And I began to hear this man use foul language that I had never heard come out of his mouth before. He was ashamed not to go along with these other guys and use the same foul language they did. He wanted them to think he's one of them. How many women wear makeup because they want the women in the world to think they're the same. They don't want the women in the world to think they're different. Now, I don't notice. I understand there's some of you women in this church that are still wearing makeup. It's only a few. But I have to go to another woman to find out because men don't always notice it. I wouldn't notice it if I just don't pay attention to it. If I do notice it, use very much, I notice it, and then I don't like it. But it's only a few, I understand, in this congregation. I won't say shame on you, but I'll say to all the rest of you women that uh, I commend you, that you have wanted to go along with God and care more, and you fear God a whole lot more than you fear what the world's going to think of you. Now, we have to make up our mind. It's the principle of the thing, and the law expands. Now then, the law is love. It expands into love toward God and love toward neighbor. At Mount Sinai, God in the person of Christ, because it was the Yahweh, the Word, who later became flesh and dwelt among us, who was called Jesus Christ, who gave them the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. No wonder he's Lord of the Sabbath. And so that the Saturday or the Sabbath is the Lord's day. Now he stretched the principle of love into ten different points. The first four elaborate how you love God. And the last six elaborate the principle of love toward neighbor. If you love your parents or your closest neighbor... You express love to them by honoring them. Your husband or wife is nearest to you. Now, outside of your, your parents came first, then the husband or the wife, then you won't commit adultery. Now, you won't murder. You won't steal. You won't lie. You won't covet. Well, those are only just principles. Now, Jesus came magnifying the law, expanding it. God's expanding himself so that we come into his family. Now he expands his law, his lifestyle, his way of life. And Jesus said that under the Old Testament, when they had to go by the strictness of the letter, a man hadn't committed murder until he killed another man. But if you just hate a man, a brother, without cause, you committed murder in your heart already. He expanded the principle way beyond the Ten Commandments. In the Old Testament, they hadn't committed adultery until the act had taken place. But Jesus said, I say to you that any man who looks after a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart, and he's guilty. Now, maybe the woman didn't even know he was doing it. She had no part in it. She didn't know anything about it. But there's the principle. And we apply sin according to its obvious intent or principle. Why did I smoke when I asked my question myself that, and I gave an honest answer, I saw I shouldn't smoke. You ask a woman, and if she'll give you an honest answer, she'll say, I'll take makeup off. But I know women in the church who have not given an honest answer. They've given a dishonest answer. And I say to any of you women, if you want to give a dishonest answer to why you use makeup, you are not going into the kingdom of God until you repent of that. Did you hear me? Because I am speaking in the name of Jesus Christ and by his authority. And we better fear God in that sense. 
Now, liberals don't want to apply the principle. Unless there's a specific thou shalt not, they say, well, isn't it okay then to go along with the devil and to go Satan's way? The world hungers and thirsts after the world's lifestyle. Liberals tried to twist the scriptures and to approve makeup in an article that came out in the Plain Truth back in 19, let's see, it was 1960, 1974. I'll tell you what happened. Let's see if I've got time to go into a little of that. Um, I was on a trip to the Far East, to Tokyo, and I think that was a trip when we were going to then go over the North Pole and from there back into, over into Europe. I don't remember just which trip. But my son came to me and said that our, uh, I had been talked into foolishly, and I should not have, but I had been uh, appointing a uh, doctrinal research committee, supposed to be scholars looking into the Greek and the Hebrew and everything. And I found out later that they were all liberals, and every one of them had this one motive and one intent. His real purpose, his real motive, was to prove that I was teaching the church wrong, and to discredit the church. They were serving the devil, and not serving God at all. Well, he came to me and said that they had found that what was in the original Hebrew in a scripture in the third chapter of Isaiah didn't mean what I had thought it said, and, uh, and therefore uh, makeup is not a sin and God doesn't condemn it, so isn't it all right? And I don't know. I, I have a single track mind. I was just mentioning during the song service. If I get to hear the music, I don't get the words. I don't know why. Now, you should. Now, you were told this morning during the song service to think of the words. Well, I had to mention that. I can't do that. I don't know why. If I think of the words, I don't get any, any sense of the music. I have a single track mind, but I can concentrate quite deeply on one thing. But I can't on two things. I knew a man that could type a letter and he was thinking what he was writing. And he could carry on a conversation on a totally different subject at the same time as someone else. Now, how he can do that, I don't know. I couldn't do that. I can only do one thing at a time, but I can do that fairly well. Well, anyway, it's one of those things that just, I, I had other things on my mind. And I said, okay, and uh, I left. And on the plane, I remember I wrote a few things to send in for what was then the Pastor General's report on, I think it was called the Bulletin at that time, back in 1974, almost well, nine years ago. And now I never saw what they printed. Several years later, it was brought to my attention. And what they printed in there, they stuck things in there over my signature and put my printed signatures on there. So that everybody thought that every word came from me. They put a lot of things in there I had not written. And it's a dead giveaway because later part of it written by another man uh, had word for word the same thing he put in as if I had written it. And I didn't write that. And then they added a lot of things and they went into a lot of scriptures to prove that they didn't say anything against makeup. So therefore, makeup was all right. Now, their whole argument was wrong. It was all to, along to the idea, if it isn't a definite specific thou shalt not, it's all right, let's go ahead, we want to go with the world. And that's what they wanted to do all along. Well, I could go into those, I don't know whether we have time. Maybe I can start to go through some of them just a little bit, I've just got a little more time. Isaiah 3.16. Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters and daughters of Zion. Now, Zion can mean our people, Israel, nationally, or it can mean the daughters in the church. Either one. Are haughty and walk with the, the stretched forth necks and wanton eyes. Now, other scriptures uh, uh, translate that uh, walk with the their heads high in a haughty manner, you see. Uh, 
and wanton eyes, uh, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. Now, it's not only the one concordance that I looked into that showed that the original words meant, I paint, but uh, the other most accredited uh, commentary also uh, quotes something to the same effect. Anyway, other, say, other translations now, if you look into all of them, will say, using the eyes to flirt. Now, as one of our ministers was saying the other day in my office, that uh, women use eyes in a different manner when they have makeup on. Makeup is used to attract attention to the eyes. And a, you can tell by a woman's eyes a good deal what her motive and her intent is. But she wants you to make advances toward her. She, she tells you with her eyes. I'm a male, I know. And when women know it too, whether they want to admit it or not. Now, it might be a few women that don't have that feminine trait, but I think most of them do. I don't think my wife ever did, but uh, she just wasn't that type. As one of them says that uh, behavior accompanies the use of makeup that draws attention to the eyes. Uh, the use of the eye, they use eyes in a different manner. Uh, now, uh, one or two of the translations use the, the word flirt, that they flirt with their eyes uh, in translating this scripture. Uh, at least it is not the meek and quiet spirit that uh, uh, you read of in First Peter 3, 4 that God says that we should have. Now, women say, well, they want to be, uh, to, to be well-groomed. All right, I favor well, good grooming. I favor that. I treated to try to be well-groomed and set the example to men. I've even spoken in sermons about coming in, uh, improperly dressed here to church. But you don't have to put a lot of paint on your face and be like the world to be well-groomed. I would feel like slapping the face of anyone who would come up and say to me that my wife, Loma, was not well-groomed because she didn't wear makeup. And Mrs. Charles Hunting was well-groomed, but she didn't need any makeup on. And yet one woman who did wear makeup said she's beautiful, but she was talking about her character. Well, now the next one. Let's see, is, uh, anyhow, it shows the spirit and attitude, and it is not the spirit and attitude of hungering and thirsting for God's righteousness, you know that. I'm certain that the, I all know that. Now, let's see, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 23, 40, next, and furthermore, that ye have, uh, sent for men uh, to come uh, from far, uh, unto whom a messenger uh, was sent, and lo, they come for whom thou didst uh, wash thyself, paintest thine eyes, deckest thyself with ornaments, and sattest uh, upon the same bed. This is talking about a whore or a harlot, and it's God speaking of Israel, and it's speaking of her as a, she was his wife as a nation. She was playing the harlot with other nations. But it's speaking of her as if she were a woman here. And that she did commit adultery. Now, these men in criticizing, they pointed out, well, it says painting the eyes, but was it wrong to wash herself? Uh, uh, to deck herself with ornaments wasn't wrong because God decked Israel with ornaments in another passage where he showed his love for her as a bride. This is showing the attitude of mind all the way through. And painting is very used as one of the things in a wrong attitude of mind. And you can't use that to say, well, then it's okay. It just simply does not do it. And if you want to take your chances with God and say that God's apostle does not have understanding of the word of God, and you understand it better than I do, go on out of the church Take your chances with God, but 
say goodbye to the rest of us because we're not going that direction. Now, Jeremiah 4.30. Well, God is speaking about Israel who had gone into adultery here, speaking of her as a woman again. And when thou art spoiled, that is, in war, and defeated in war, what wilt thou do? Go, thou clothest thyself with crimson, the uh, crimson or scarlet especially is the color of a harlot, Though thou deckest thee with ornaments of gold, though thou rentest thy uh, face with painting in vain, shalt thou make thyself fair, thy lovers will despise thee. In other words, it's showing doing the way of the world to attract men. Now, there are ways in which a woman can wear jewelry modestly and not wear it lavishly. I was in a jewelry store in Beverly Hills and they showed me a, a bracelet that a, a very noted movie actress was going to buy. In fact, she came in and, and uh, was photographed uh, with me at the time and uh, was a hundred thousand dollars. But it was a blazing thing to appear on a bare breast of diamonds that would knock your eyes out. Now, it was not modest in any sense of the word. And that kind of thing uh, would be condemned because it is extravagant, it is overdone, and it's too flashy and attracts attention. It's in bad taste. We believe in proper grooming and good taste and all of that kind of thing. But there is a limit to some of these things. Now, Second Kings, let me see, Second Kings 9 and verse 30. Oh, and when Jehu was uh, come to Jezebel. Now, Jezebel is one of the most evil women painted in the, uh, pictured in the Bible. Uh, she was extremely worldly. Jezebel uh, heard of it, and she painted her face and tired her head and uh, looked out the window. Well, Jehu came and had her thrown down, and the dogs uh, ate her flesh, and that was the end of Jezebel at that time. But it shows that Jezebel was one who painted her face. Now, I have said that the modern use of makeup on women came from horrors. And it did. Now, one minister's wife was here, and that was several months ago, and I think that might have been a year and a half ago, about the time this was coming up before. And uh, she, this minister's wife, cried and, and acted like a spoiled child, and she said well, that I was accusing the women of being uh, harlots. Now, I have not done anything of the kind, and you brethren know that. I say that it came out of harlotry. And I say that women are following harlots. That doesn't mean that they themselves are harlots, but in that they're following a harlot. Maybe not in fornication and in harlotry, but in that they are. And harlots do it to attract men. And they're of the world. And they're the evil in the world. And it's wanting to be like the world and like the evil in the world. And that's the only reason why women do it. Now, brethren, I don't expect to keep hammering away on this thing of makeup. I don't expect to talk about it again. And I'm sorry I've had to today. But we've started getting this church back on the track. I don't know that I'm going to live a lot longer. I think a lot of you, brethren, don't realize that I'm not only going to enter my 92nd year next month, But that over five years ago now, I had total heart failure, and I have to watch my heart every single day. And I don't know what minute it's going to stop, and it's beating irregularly now. I have to have my blood pressure taken very often, sometimes every day, and I, I have it taken on a trip, and I'm traveling on a trip, I have my blood pressure taken every night and every morning, and my pulse felt. 
I never go without having an oxygen tank taken along. We don't know what minute I'm going to have to have oxygen, or you just won't have me with you any longer. But I want to get some of these things straightened out in the church while I'm still here. And I hope that God will... Uh, maybe it's going to take a miracle from God to keep me on very much longer. I talked to a brother-in-law of mine on the telephone yesterday. He looks, because I haven't seen him in recent years, and the way he talked yesterday. He's five or six years younger than I, but he seems to be a great many years older. But thank God, God has given me a mind that has continued to be usable, a voice that has continued to be usable, and I'm doing the best I can to continue on the job as long as I can. But I do have to tell you that it's just by the grace of God that I'm still with you. And how much longer I'll be with you, maybe in one more heartbeat, it may be several years. And that depends on God, not on me. And I have nothing to live for but you brethren and the work that God has set before me. And I, I, I hope you realize that, and I think you do. I think you do. Well, now, just in closing, finally, why do men smoke? Why do women paint their faces? I told you why men smoke. And women paint their faces for vanity, which is the very father of sin, as I've shown you. It was vanity that seized Mother Eve and started her to, and, and Adam into sin. It was vanity that started the great archangel into sin and started sin in the first place in the whole universe. Or secondly, it was to be like the world and to look like the world. Or third, it is fear of what the world is going to think of you if you don't. Fear God and not the world, brethren. Now, God didn't put government here on the earth. Lucifer was supposed to govern. He didn't. It went wrong. Adam could have governed. He didn't. Christ came. He didn't come to govern the world. He came to call some out that will govern the world. But he did put government in the church. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. Put that man out. Now shall I, shall I come with a rod, or shall I come in kindness, brethren? Which do you want? He said that we should be, uh, to the ministers over us, that we should have love to those that bear the rule over us in the church. There is rule, there is government in the church. And we are to govern the world. And it is Lucifer who became Satan who took government out of the church. God is restoring government in his church. It had gone when I came into the church over 50 years, or just about 50. Well, I came in among them over 50 years ago now. So we're about to the 50th anniversary of this church, and we will celebrate it during the Feast of Tabernacles this year. We're into the 50th anniversary of the church. And we're getting into the third generation, really, of the church now. And... My, so many of you sitting here today were not even born yet when the church started 50 years ago, because perhaps most of you are under 50 years of age. But anyway, the church has got to be back on the track. And I thought we were getting back on the track, and we need to get a little closer on the track. And I hope that we understand now a little better, and I've made it a little more plain today, what sin is. It's not a direct, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt or thou shalt not. It is the, of course, that is, if, if God says thou shalt not, that means you shall not. If he says you shall, well, that's a definite command. But I mean, we apply the principle. Where there is no definite, thus saith the Lord, you apply the principle. And that's what I've tried to do, and that's what I'm trying to cause you to understand. And that principle of applying the principle of love to God and love to neighbor and expanding that principle, it will expand into any given circumstance. 
Any question that may come up, you can tell whether it's God's will or not by just applying that principle that I've shown you here this afternoon. So, let's go on and have the church cleaned up and have the church not only on the track, but steaming full speed ahead on the track. For more information, please visit our website at www.coglittleflock.com.